thousand people. Pretty impressive. Yeah, we're at four, almost 400. Yeah, despite Zoom fatigue. There, there we topped the 400 mark. I think at 450, at 450 tabs, we'll start. Will we have access to the recording? Mm. Yeah, we'll figure that part out. All right, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Ortho Mentor 10th webinar. It is uh, 9 p.m., and so we'll be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, I am going to just do quick introductions and then turn the, the uh, festivities over to Tab Zayer. Tab Zayer is our moderator tonight. He's an associate professor and Chief of Foot and Ankle Surgery in the Residency Program Associate Director and Associate Dean of Medical Education at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, John Barlow is an Assistant Professor. He's a shoulder and elbow surgeon and loves trauma as well. He's the Residency Director at the Mayo Clinic. Trent Guthrie is our special guest uh, tonight, not uh, advertised. He's an Assistant Professor at Henry Ford Hospital. He's a trauma surgeon at Henry Ford, and he is the uh, was the chair of the AOA CORD Subcommittee on Signaling. So we're gonna start off with Dr. Guthrie in a moment. Uh, Mac Hogan, we're sorry to say, had a family emergency, so uh, will not be joining us, but uh, obviously we wish him and his family the best. Uh, Monica Kogan is an assistant professor. She's a director of pediatric orthopedics. She's a residency program director at Rush University Medical Center, and she has tremendous audiovisual problems uh, at her home right now. Uh, Dr. William McGarvey is an associate professor of orthopedic surgery, is a foot and ankle surgeon, and the residency director at McGovern Medical School of UT Health in Houston. And finally, Nicole, don't call me Nicole, Nikki Schroeder is the chief of hand, elbow, and upper extremity. She's a clinical professor. Uh, she's the director of the UCSF uh, orthopedic resident education curriculum and the associate residency director at UCSF. So this is an unbelievable group of um, educators who are here tonight to share with all of you. We're up to 559 and counting. So we're really thrilled to have you all here. It's a very scary time. Uh, we know that 2022 freaked everybody out. It certainly freaked us out. Uh, I will say simply that that's a math problem. I've said it many times, uh, but let's face it. We have uh, far more applicants than we have spots. And so what you're gonna hear from these esteemed people tonight are hopefully ways that you can uh, self-advocate for you as well as get your mentors at your local uh, programs to hopefully help you as well. But I'd like to start out before we get any further uh, by speaking with Dr. Guthrie. Trent, I really wanna focus on two topics. One, you were the chair of the AOA CORD subcommittee. And so kudos to CORD for trying to attack some of these really significant issues that we face with the residency match process for medical students. So number one, tell us um, basically what was your perspective on why signaling? Why was that the one thing that we thought orthopedics should try to get into in this cycle? Yeah, well, thank you very much. I, I think that uh, starting off, yeah, I, I would echo what you said about uh, this being uh, scary and the numbers continuing to get out of control. If you look at this year, uh, we were up at about 87 applications per applicant, uh, 150,000 total applications this year, totaling $3.37 million in application fees. And the, the numbers are just staggering. And um, as the, the CORD working group uh, on uh, application limits, uh, our, our task was to improve this kind of over-application phenomenon that has grown over the years. Uh, it, there's a tremendous burden and cost to the applicants, a burden to the program to review so many applications, uh, as we're all doing our best to have a holistic review of, of each and every application. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, there's just an inability for applicants to truly show their interest in programs. And that's where uh, we kind of very quickly moved on to signaling as a way to add value, both for the applicants and for the programs. Uh, when you look now, when there's so many applications out there, each application really has very little value. There's no real way to communicate from applicants to programs uh, their, their interest. 
Um, so uh, the signaling, what is it? Uh, well, it's, it's a token system and it grants applicants the ability to select their most preferred programs at the time of application. This is something that's been used uh, in multiple specialties over the past uh, uh, two cycles uh, with some mixed results. Uh, the, the programs that have used it before have had uh, a relatively small number of signals uh, based off of what was previously used in uh, the economics field. Uh, so they had five signals for the most part uh, over the past few cycles. And, and what we saw was most applicants use these as kind of aspirational tokens. These are my reach programs that I really want to go to. So I'm going to send my five signals uh, to those programs. And, and what we saw was this clustering at the top. 50% of all signals went to the top 25% of programs. And that loses value for the signals because the top programs get nothing but signals. And then the bottom programs don't get any signals. And so at the end of the day, there's just really no value to that. Those are, you're kind of throwing away those signals at those aspirational programs. Um, what came out of it on the positive side was that program directors uh, reported looking at applications that otherwise they would not have. So again, the, there's some hint that there's value there to, uh, to be had. Um, and overall in survey data at the end, the majority of program directors and applicants both uh, rated the process as overall favorable to what they had before. Um, so I'm sure you've all heard uh, that uh, we have decided to participate in signaling this year from a, a court AOA perspective. Um, and we have come up with uh, 30 as the number of signals to use. And, and that seems like a, a big deviation from before. So I wanna take a moment to explain that. Um, again, with an eye towards maximizing the value for both applicants and programs, we thought we needed to get up to a higher number in order to be able to reach the full spectrum of applicants and, and, and programs. Um, you know, the top applicants need to get signals, but the bottom, app, uh, the bottom uh, programs also need to, to get signals. Uh, the, the most competitive applicants want to have enough signals to get to those competitive programs, but we also need to have uh, the less competitive applicants uh, be able to spread them out as well. So uh, going up to 30, uh, we, we massage the historical uh, application data and match data from ARIS and from uh, NRMP to kind of come up with that number of uh, what would be a good target. Um, there is some literature out there in other specialties also looking at uh, kind of a simulated um, application cap uh, in, in urology uh, this year. There was a great paper about that. And they found if, if they had a number of 25 with similar numbers to us, um, that they found that uh, the match wouldn't uh, really have been affected anyway. In other words, uh, it was upwards of 85% uh, of, of uh, uh, matches ended up the same way if you capped at 25. Uh, so we, we added a little bit of a cushion and, and stayed at 30. Um, and so one thing that this does is it allows for more strategic application, and we call it weighting of the signals, where your more competitive applicants can send more of those aspirational uh, tokens to the top programs, but your less competitive applicants can say, uh, well, I'm going to maybe save a lot of my signals for uh, well, less competitive, I, I don't want to call them safety schools because I think every program is, is fantastic out there, but um, you know, it allows you to, based on advisors' uh, opinions at your schools, it allows you to be a little bit more strategic about how you send those applications rather than the historical, well, I'm just going to shotgun 80 or 100 programs and see what happens. Um, another thing is it allows for uh, some specialized strategies. So say you are really geographically limited and I only want to hit the Midwest hard because my family's here or, or, or other issues. Uh, it allows you to do that. Uh, if you're doing a couples match, I think it, uh, it adds a little bit of weight to that for you to be able to do that a little bit more strategically. So how are you uh, going to participate? Uh, this is an opt-in process for both programs and applicants uh, in the ARIS supplemental application. Uh, the supplemental application uh, allows you to put in additional information for meaningful uh, experiences, some geographic pre preferences, but also the signaling. This is where you will do the signaling. Uh, you'll have 30 signals of equal weight. There's no additional cost for applicants or programs. 
And our recommendation is signal all programs in which you have a high interest, including your home programs and your away rotation programs. Uh, we wanted to do that because, uh, you know, honestly, there may be a situation where you go to an away, uh, on away rotation and you really don't like that program and you don't want to um, uh, waste a signal on that. Um, the other important thing is uh, there will be more signals than interviews. So don't expect an interview just because you signal the program. Uh, but you also should realize that uh, uh, programs will be looking at more than just the signals, and you may receive interviews from programs that you did not signal. Um, and I know there are going to be a lot of questions. Uh, we have an FAQ that's out there uh, on the, uh, the CORD website. Um, but uh, if you, uh, um, again, I, I want to save some time for questions because I, I yeah, already so see Trent, them rolling through Trent, the chat. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt now and thank you so much. And we certainly, you're welcome to, to stay on um, for the rest of the webinar. Uh, the chat box is blowing up right now, but we are going to go on to uh, the, the rest of the program and signaling will be covered again. So tabs. Uh, why don't you take it away? And I'd just like to thank all the students uh, and participants for being here. Uh, the reason we do this is because there's a lot of unanswered questions out there. And obviously this has served a for gives you a forum. Uh, we can answer all your questions. And obviously there's a lot of things that are gonna be um, uh, still challenges, but we're all in this together to try to make this a better process. And that's why all these faculty are here tonight uh, donating their time. So take it away, Tabs, thanks. Well, first off, thanks, Dr. Guthrie, thanks for being here. Uh, to the panelists, thanks for being here as well. Dr. Levine, kind intro as always. Uh, I still remember when I reached out to him to kind of kick this off and we're like, hey, two years ago, let's start doing this in the thick of COVID and here we are two years later, still having, still having technical difficulties. So, but the reality is such is life and we move on. And as we move on, we find that the process is changing and changing rapidly in front of our eyes. So I'm Amita Bayer, Tabs Iyer, as people commonly call me. I am the founder of OrthoMentor. And one of the things that we're gonna start by doing is dissecting out a little bit uh, with the wonderful program directors here, what happened this past year? And you know, the first questions I'll throw to Dr. McGarvey and Dr. Schroeder, um, why do you think the numbers are going up? I mean, we saw, as Dr. Guthrie was just talking about, you know, three point something million dollars spent in applications. Why are the numbers going up? Uh, Nikki, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this, but I, I just had, you know, three thoughts on this. Um, one, and most obvious, is ortho is a cool thing to do, right? So, I mean, it's uh, people are gaining interest because they spend more time seeing that orthopedics is a is a high quality and um, and quite frankly, a high return um, subspecialty. Um, but some, some practical things, without travel in the last two years, there's basically so little cost in terms of actually having to go to the programs that the, the cost of the increased number of applications is offset by the fact that you can stay home and interview even with multiple programs on the same day. So there's definitely a financial consideration which will probably be diluted again this year because um, people will start traveling again, presumably. And then the thing that's coming up that I'm sure we'll talk about as we go forward is um, less and less reliance on scores as scores go away. And so um, at least at my own school, there is, uh, there is some level of guidance or has been based not exclusively, but certainly heavily on people's performance on step scores that suggests that if you're not competitive, maybe you should really consider a less competitive field. As the scores go away, that restriction or that limitation or that advisement will also go away. And so people who have not been competitive from a standardized test uh, perspective in the past have now all of a sudden, they don't have to worry about that anymore. Nikki, I'm, I'm curious to your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think those are all great points. And certainly the first one is the best because obviously ortho is great. Um, and, you know, I do think you know, there, there's a question of whether some of the number of applicants overall increased this year because people took some time off from the year before related to COVID. So we may have just had a bloom in the years, you know, related to COVID where people said, hey, look, I didn't, you know, get to finish my rotations. I want to be able to do research. I didn't get exposure to orthopedics. And so some of those people defer a year to do research or to do, you know, other clinical activities. 
Um, so I think that contributes to it. I don't think we know fully how many people are expected to apply this year. And then I do think, you know, financials and uh, the impact of, you know, not having scores has played a part in it. And then hopefully some of the reason is because, you know, we're diversifying as a field and now we're getting more people who are interested in orthopedics when previously it was more like stereotyped people going to orthopedics. And now we're trying to say, hey, that's not who we are. Like we need to better represent our population. So like, come if you're interested. So I think it's kind of all of that. Those are all great points that uh, both Dr. McGarvey and Dr. Scherter brought up. And I'm going to direct sort of the next thing. This is something that Dr. Levine and I talk about all the time. Um, and Dr. McGarvey brought up the point about the advising, at least what's happening down at UT Houston. And, you know, are we, so clearly scores are going away. So maybe some semblance of self-selection as, as we've talked about has, you know, is playing a role. Diversification, as Dr. Schroeder mentioned. Are the schools doing a good enough job? Pro programs, schools, combination thereof. Um, and I'll direct this to Dr. Barlow first. Are they doing an adequate job of reviewing strengths of applications as a whole? Um, is it something you're seeing kind of inconsistently happening? Is it something that's happening sort of, you know, hom homogeneously across the programs, or is this, or is that a contributing factor as well? I think uh, for sure it, it has been a contributing factor in terms of uh, the places people go and the mentorship that they receive as they go out. Um, the One of the things that I think is challenging, and I, I would just pass along to the medical students, is it's, it's hard for us to anticipate. I don't think any of us anticipated this year would look like it did um, after they went through. So I think if you say the question, did we advise people um, as well as we should have, I think you have to say that we probably didn't in hindsight based on what we saw. And, and my sense is that, um, and this is what the rest of the conversation is about, I think there's always been differences in, in applicants. Um, and I think there was a sense this year that there was a middle tier to me as I reviewed applications. There was a middle tier of applicants who I thought for sure would match, who kind of fell through the cracks with the application process and broad applications and then virtual uh, interview processes. So I don't think we've done a perfect job, but I also think that the amount of content that is out there and available for, for applicants continues to increase. And it's more of, um, I think there's more information available to people. It's more about the action side, which we will continue to talk about as we go forward in terms of that advising and how people signal out, including both the signaling we talked about, but then the sort of more local signaling between away rotations and mentors uh, helping you and signaling to the program. I think that's where we have lots of opportunities for improvement in my mind. And Dr. Levine, I'll actually, um, I'll ask you the kind of similar question and say, how good do we, how good are we at saying, hey, you know, to Dr. McGarvey's point, how good are we saying, hey, your application is strong, or your application is not, and you should not consider the specialty. How good of a job are we doing that to help filter out, you know, this sort of rising growth of applications, whether it's just in this blip of COVID, um, but it was also rising even before. So now if it continues in this pattern, how do we sort of filter that down further? Well, I, I think there's a small percentage of students and historically, let's just base it on objective metrics because that's what we were so heavily focused on. So there was a small percentage of students that were quote unquote, not as competitive as the typical orthopedic student, let's put it that way. And in the, for those students, we would often counsel them that they needed to do something additionally to make them more competitive. And that usually meant taking a year or two of scholarly productivity research to try to boost their application. And that was typically a student that might've had lower scores, uh, not many third year clerkship grades, et cetera. So now, as uh, uh, Dr. McGarvey says, we're going to get rid of more objective metrics, and it's going to become even more challenging to really know, well, what is a competitive student? And right now, I think that, that bears a lot of discussion. Uh, and my perspective is, as an educator, is that I agree at, at face value that trying to ju judge this on scores is ridiculous. We all know that none of that depend, will relate to how good an orthopedic surgeon you may or may not be. But until we have a suitable alternative, whether it's virtual reality uh, and surgical skills assessment in medical school, which absolutely should be happening, uh, and other uh, objective things that actually mean you could be a good surgeon, we don't have a suitable surrogate yet. Uh, so I think the, there's a small percentage of students that 
are, give, are given counsel to not apply and they still want to and they go ahead and they don't match. But the majority of the students not matching are in that middle tier group that are super competitive, just like John Barlow just said, and it's just a numbers problem. It's a numbers problem and it's an advocacy problem and it's a contact problem. And I describe it to people as uh, the 25 something problem. So you know what the 25 something problem is? That's the person who was one of the top 25 students in the country. They got invited to 15 programs, but they didn't really have a connection to any of the 15 and they get ranked 25 at all 15 programs. Think about that. You're one of the top 25 students in the country and you go unmatched. And Tabs and I, and many of the people on this webinar have spoken to 50, 60, 70 of those 25 somethings that are out there. So it's a real challenge. You know, you bring up a great point. You and Dr. Barlow both that it is, there's that sort of middle ground. And I think, and advocacy as we'll talk about a little bit later, I think definitely plays a big role. But you mentioned this sort of, hey, how do you make up? Like, how do you counsel someone who may not be as strong? And to Dr. Kogan, you know, do you think whether at Rush or across the country, um, as in, you know, as someone who's known nationally for this kind of stuff, you know, are we providing enough guidance in sort of, hey, what do you do if someone's not as competitive? And are the programs giving enough insight in how best do you work on strengthening your app if you're going to apply to orthopedics or anything competitive for that? Hi. So um, this is a great question and it's it's really complicated because I think it depends, you know, there's some programs that do a great job of um, setting expectations for students and kind of planning their path forward. And there's other programs that um, may not do as great of a job. And there's some students that take that advice and run with it. And then there's other students that kind of take their own advice and talk to medical students and then go in their own separate direction. And so, you know, I really, really, really encourage everybody to, um, to listen to their program directors and listen to their mentors and, um, you know, take the advice from people who know and not from other medical students who really don't know as much as the people with gray hair who have gone through this and have seen students succeed and have seen students fail. That's, those are some wonderful points there. And you know, we've got some really esteemed institutions here. And I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Schroeder, who's bottom right to me or bottom left to me. Um, you know, tell me, how, how did your program do? How did UCSF do, if you don't mind me asking? What kinds of things do you think worked and what kinds of things do you think didn't work kind of looking back at this particular cycle? Um, yeah, I, you know, we did the same that we always did. So we we matched very well and we're very pleased with it. Didn't go any lower than we had previously. When we rank, we rank based on people that we want, not based on knowing where we think they're going to end up. I mean, sometimes you interview somebody and you know that they're going to be number one all over the country. And then, you know, we still choose to rank them number one if we think that they are the number one. Um, so we're okay, you know, going further down on our list knowing that we're just ranking the best applicants. Um, and I think, you know, what worked really well is we had a great education staff that really worked with us and with our holistic review ideas of how to best set up our interview day and how best to, you know, transfer the students among rooms, but also get them an exposure to UCSF for those who hadn't been out here. Um, and I think that that's you know, you, it's, it's not really about like finding a fit, because I think that's a tough word, and I've mentioned that before, but, you know, getting them a sense of who the program is and who the faculty is, and we believe that everybody, all of our faculty members who want to interview are able and encouraged to interview so that you can see who we are as a faculty, and then we have our residents there, and we have a separate resident room where they get to meet the residents, and, you know, we had some stuff there, and I think that worked really well, because I think it's hard to get to know a program when you have never been there. That's a great, that's a great point. Um, and to Dr. McGarvey, I'll actually ask you, so on the student side, you know, how did, um, did the students at your, you know, applying for McGovern, did they do sort of average, you know, in terms of their match rates, how do they do relative to prior years? What kinds of things work to sort of facilitate matching if they did? What kinds of things did not work uh, on the student sides? Uh, it's interesting. Um, with the numbers increasing, we actually had in the last two years, fewer applicants from our school 
uh, from our home institution. Um, and, and the numbers, the match rate's pretty consistent. Um, there are a few every year that don't, unfortunately, match. And um, this past year, I think we had two. Um, I've spoken to them, one is almost as recently as, as actually today. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a challenge to try and figure out exactly why, because both were extremely competitive. If you look at the applications, Dr. Levine said, you know, I mean, they, they could have easily gone to any number of, of programs throughout the country based on objective metrics, scores, and et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into it, but, um, you know, it, it really sometimes because of the, I, I think over time as the application numbers have increased, so has the competitive nature of the individual applicant. You know, everybody is, is on some of these unofficial websites that they all have access to and picking up, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing? Everybody's doing a lot of the same things and it's really hard to distinguish amongst students who are applying to orthopedics to say that somebody's really substantially different. And what it really boils down to, quite honestly, in a lot of circumstances, I, I think, is just, you know, connection, connection in the interview process, connection with the faculty if they've done a rotation, establishing personal relationships. I think that takes on a huge piece as we go forward because everybody's applications are so competitive that it's really hard to distinguish yourself. Those are amazing points. And uh, Dr. Kogan, I'll ask you, um, obviously, I don't know how the Rush students did, but why do you think um, of, you know, whether it was a Rush or any other students reaching out to you, um, why do you think they didn't match? Like what's sort of been your perspective um, based on what you're observing of students either at Rush or otherwise, uh, as far as, you know, some patterns uh, that have led? So um, we had five Rush students. They all matched, thankfully. Um, they were all very um, different sort of applicants, and they all geographically were looking kind of in different areas, which I think 100% helped them out um, significantly. Um, and they all kind of planned that out ahead of time as to where they were going to apply, where they were doing their way rotations, um, which I, I think worked in their best interest. Um, there were some rush, um, there, there were some research students that I know of that didn't match. Um, there were students from other programs that didn't match. Um, and, you know, a lot of them, it's just, I don't, I don't know, you know, I mean, some of the students uh, didn't, will even say that they didn't really advocate for themselves. You know, they didn't reach out to program directors. They didn't reach out to medical, they didn't reach out to residents from programs that they were interested in. And they were super solid applicants. I mean, I was just, you know, 17 interviews, you know, 50 publications, you know, good solid medical school, nice, yeah, I mean, nice, you know, kid, if you will. I mean, I don't want to call him a kid, but, you know, a, just a nice applicant and normal and, you know, hardworking and they didn't match. And I think that, you know, not advocating for themselves, not reaching out, not getting their name known, not having a connection, I definitely think that it hurt them. Those are, and we're going to touch upon some of those points that I'm sure have, you know, piqued students' interest um, in the next couple of questions. And I'll ask this to uh, Dr. Barlow and Dr. Schroeder. Um, you know, what sort of things have you observed in, you know, as Dr. Kogan's mentioning, talking to students sort of on a national level? And, you know, she brought up a great point. Should students be planning or coordinating? especially now many students, whether, you know, when I was in Miami last year, we had double digit numbers, multiple institutions across the country have more than 10, you know, are, is that part of the issue because you're competing, you know, with your fellow classmates? Um, and should there be more of a formal coordination, whether sort of unofficially by the students or formally by the faculty, should that be happening? And is that contributing to uh, match rates or lack of match at uh, particular? Yeah, I'll, I'll say, nope. I, you know, I'll just say that um, we have a lot of students going into ortho this year. Last year we had two, the year before we had like six. Um, and, and I think it's really important when you have large numbers to make sure that they as a group sit down and try and work it out. And I think that, you know, looking at other programs that routinely like Miami and Georgetown that routinely have a lot of people going into programs, that's the number one advice that they always give is, is 
if you guys can't sort it out as a class together, then we need to know about it so that we can help you. Because several years ago, we had six outstanding applicants and they all did sub eyes at almost the exact same places. And like I've said, like most schools aren't gonna give six interviews to UCSF students, right? They might give it to the top two, they might give it to the top three at most, but they're not giving them to all six, even if all six are outstanding. So I think it's really important to make your list with your classmates, decide where you wanna go, look at geography and try and work it out. And if you can't work it out amongst them, then you need to sit down with your you know, OSIG coordinator, the program director, the associate program director and have that discussion with them. Hey, Tabs, can I just make a comment about that? Nikki, I hope everybody's listening to that. Um, we get, I mean, listen, we're, we're not naive. We get <laughs> that there's a, the majority of students out there are at places where they don't get any feedback. They can't get any feedback. They don't know where they're ranked. They don't know how to, you know, to do all this stuff. I, we get it. And I, I've been a little bit slow on the uptake, but I'll, I'll take full responsibility for that because I've been doing it the same way for 23 years. And I think that's how other people do it. And I know they don't. So the bottom line is for the students out there that are thinking, well, my school doesn't do this. I don't have anybody to talk to. You just heard from Dr. Schroeder. We said it at webinar number eight, no program is going to interview more than three students from a, a school almost across the board. Sometimes it might only be two. So if you're in a place right now with 15 students and six of you are going to the same place to do a sub I, that is a total waste of your time. And three or four of you have just gone to a place you're not going to get an interview. And you need to know that going in because it's not going to help you if you're trying to maximize. You can say, well, I'm competitive and I don't really care about the other 14. But even if you're that person, it behooves you to work together because then all 15 of you can try to match from your school which ultimately is the goal. Even though you want to match at the best program, we, we, that's great, but the other 14 need to match as well from your school. And you're not responsible for them, but you don't want to kill each other before you're, you're compared to the other 1,400, 1,600 students in the country. Dr. Barlow, I think you were about to say something. Go. Yeah, no, the other thing I was going to say, just speaking to, I, I think it's, it's critically important, and uh, one of the other things that I've, I've, we did, um, our, our program had, uh, our medical school had a couple not matched, so our rate was lower than uh, what it historically had been here, and I think I did a kind of a deep dive. It's obviously devastating to us to have that happen too for people that we know and and mentor along and and have them not be able to go forward. And I did a little bit of a deep dive in terms of what those applications look like. I think there was kind of two categories. The ones like Dr. Kogan talked about where they got a bunch of uh, interviews, we actually didn't have many of those. What we had was more people who the, the deal was almost done before it started and they had four, you know, they were competitive applicants and they had four interviews and the odds by that point had already uh, really uh, decreased a lot. To my perspective, and I think this speaks um, strongly to the rest of what we're going to talk about today. But my strong sense is in the absence of compelling scores and in in, when research becomes more and more competitive, people are gonna look at letters and they're gonna look at their rotations, their clinical rotations more and more and more. We've worked hard in orthopedics to get away from descriptive letters where you get a letter that says, you know, they were an outstanding student and they showed up and they did their job to um, a more, let's say, binary application process where quantitative application or a letter of recommendation process. But now the vast majority, I think it's the majority this year, I don't know the recent studies, the majority of applica applications said rank to match. They had that box checked, the very top box. So if you got anything except that box checked, it was a little bit of a liability for people. I think the letters really drove a lot of the interview numbers down for outstanding applicants. That's why it's a little bit scary to applicants because they say, oh, 265, 27 publications, blank, blank. But they might have had a letter that said middle rank and they're going to have a really hard time matching there. I think that's actually really good because we're judging people on their clinical performance doing orthopedic surgery. So it's not the worst thing in the world that you get there. It's just a little bit hard as an applicant to know what your letters look like. But the ones that I reviewed where they had problems, it was letter-based problems. And I think 
program directors got pretty savvy about looking through those letters and figuring out in a holistic review where they came. So I think the ones that I looked at that I had access to uh, were that ones or were letter based problems and their rotation issues. Those are some amazing points all the way around. Um, I want to keep us moving along here. And there's, you know, you, many of you have talked to me, have heard me share similar sentiments. So I won't, you know, kind of digress into that right now. But, you know, I think one thing you're hearing, um, and especially assuming you've gotten the number of interviews, and Dr. Kogan was mentioning this, 15, 16, 17 interviews, then, you know, there was sort of, then what happened, right? And Dr. Levine and I and others have probably spoken to many students who were in that boat. And so I'll, I'll ask Dr. Kogan to start, you know, how important was this advocacy piece? You mentioned it, Dr. Levine and I talk about it all the time, others I'm sure mentioned it too. You know, how important was it by, from a student level, by a faculty level, program directors, associate program directors, by chairs, you know, kind of talk us through sort of that spectrum, like how much did that matter in this cycle in particular? Um, I think that the students who advocated for themselves were at a much greater advantage than those who did not. And um, I think that it it's not just the reaching out to a program director. Um, it is how people would reach out to program directors. So some people would reach out and be just on the other end of the Zoom, just kind of wanting to have FaceTime. And those were kind of not the best use of everybody's time. Um, you know, I found that when students came with questions, when they were interested in the program or interested in picking my brain or, you know, parsing through their application or parsing through their CV or, you know, trying to understand how to make themselves more competitive, understanding what to look for in programs, understanding what makes a good resident, when they would come with questions, it was a much more fluid and organic sort of meeting. Um, and you got to learn about the applicant a little bit more. And so when that application came across my computer, I could say, oh, I know this person. And this person seems like, you know, uh, you know, when deciding between two applicants, one that you've talked, spoken with, and you somewhat know, and another one who's just name on a page with the exact same application, I think the advocacy definitely helped. And now, you know, those are, and I think, I think you're absolutely right. And I've observed this myself. In fact, I'll give the story of there was a kid from a, you know, program on the West Coast who reached out to me. And, you know, again, this sort of stud that we're describing and said applicant had 15, 16 interviews and was literally told by the residents, do not reach out to programs. And I was, I was here, I was on paternity leave and I was just mind blown. And even when that student reached back out to that home program, they literally said what you just said, Dr. Kogan, why didn't you reach out to us? Why didn't you let us know? So I'll direct the next sort of follow-up question to Dr. Levine, you know, does it make a difference? And everyone can chime in. Does it make a difference if I make a phone call, if Dr. Barlow makes a phone call, if other faculty members who have worked closely with the student make a phone call, do those phone calls truly make a difference? Because I think there's that sort of urban legend, it does, it doesn't, the residents sort of have one perspective on it, but you know, uh -huh. at least for current modern times, does it make a difference? Okay, so uh, there's a ton of questions in the chat box and I can't keep up with all of them, so I'm doing my best. But the bottom line is this, it's, it's about timing, and it's about what, what you're really thinking about with, these, with this communication. So what does that mean? It means that when I get a call after someone didn't match, that they've got this amazing student that we should have interviewed, that's really way too late. I mean, is that the most obvious statement I've ever made? Of course it is, but think about that. That advocate didn't pick up a phone and call me and say, hey, Bill, I know you had 1,700 applications or 1,200 or whatever it is, but you didn't, you, you probably overlooked this amazing student who didn't get an interview. They have a connection to New York City. They went to undergrad there, the, this, that, or the other. Would you please take a look at him? Because I think you might want to interview that person. Now that is really valuable. Now, after the interview invitations go out, that same phone call is not as valuable because we've already gone through the whole process and now we might have to be squeezing another applicant in. We only interview one day. That's a big deal to us. To other programs, maybe not as a big, big of a deal. So the point is that if you really are interested in programs, this gets to what signaling is about, Trent. 
So we're talking about signaling. Well, you can signal as an applicant. All the students were asking the questions. You get 30 ways to tell program directors you're interested. That is 25 more than you've ever had in the history of orthopedic applications. So for everybody who's trying to figure out if this is going to work, and, and God knows none of us know, this is an experiment. And I, I applaud AOA Cord. And I do want to give props to Joe Bernstein, who I think might be here tonight, because he's been talking about roses since The Bachelor and Bachelorette uh, came out. And he's written about it. And so thanks, Joe, because you finally get to see if this is going to work. So you get 30 roses, you get 30 PDs that you can say, hey, I'm interested in your program. You couldn't do that before. You couldn't have your advocate call 30 places. At max, you could have them call three to five. So I'm cautiously optimistic that that's gonna be a positive. Those are uh, some incredible, incredible points. Um, and just as an alert, there was an inappropriate comment in the chat box, completely inappropriate, that will not be tolerated, um, just as an FYI, okay? Um, I just said that out there, uh, it was mentioned as well, but that is not absolutely unnecessary in this day and age, okay? Completely unnecessary. Uh, moving on to just, you know, lots of great commentary. We're all here to empower each other and lift each other up. Um, it's particularly important to really understand, is there other facets of the application that become important? So Dr. McGarvey, uh, take us home for this final section of what facets of the app sort of stood out to you more so this particular year? And was there anything that has changed sort of no, or was there anything that changed maybe knowing what the next couple of years would hold? Well, so I, I think the, the application hasn't really changed in a long time. So it's really just what you take away from it. And I think um, knowing, uh, so I'm gonna answer the second part first, the things, knowing that the change would occur, um, at least in my mind, I kind of positioned myself to think, okay, if I didn't have scores and, and I'm gonna be transparent, I mean, we use scores, you get a thousand plus applications, however many you get, you have to have some type of filtration system. And so, you know, whether everybody agrees with this, whether everybody likes it or not, I mean, scores have to play some level of a role. But knowing that that was going to be something that was going to be that that wouldn't be a crutch in the future, um, I tried to take that out and start looking at what are the other features to go to your first question. And um, I, I think, just like John pointed out, you know, I, I think as far as the application, if we're strictly applying it, the letters, while they're not perfect still give you insight into an individual because the application process and the interview process, you know, I mean, anybody can sell themselves in 10 or 15 minutes. You know, you just you get a little caffeine, get yourself psyched up for it, and you can you can nail your interview. But it's a, it's a matter of what you've done over the course of time. And so, you know, it's not just it's teasing through, as he said, the letter and what the features of the letter are. You know, is this a letter that was written by a chairman who had no contact with an individual and spliced pieces together to just say nice things? Or is this somebody that actually had a meaningful relationship, not only clinically, but maybe in a research lab for a prolonged period of time, really got to know somebody and was sincere about this is one of the top 5% of students I've trained in the last 25 years. I mean, there are certain phrases and comments that you can sift through to pick those things out. So the letters certainly took on a larger role. Um, you know, the other lessons learned is that while it's not perfect, virtual was much better than expected. Um, the process of virtual applications was dreaded by everybody within the last two years by, in our program. And it turned out that it actually wasn't as bad and was much more efficient. We were on time way more these past two years in our, in our interview process than ever in the 13 years prior to that as, part, as my program directorship. And, and, it, and the whole thing reinforced the fact that um, while not everybody can come, and we certainly don't limit our, our rank list to people who have rotated the program, there is, in my mind, no better way to evaluate somebody than what they're doing when nobody's watching them. You know, what resident feedback gives us, what they do late at night when they're tired after they've been working all day and they take call and they've been put against it because they had to put a lecture together. So 
those are just some some letters or some lessons learned. I also think, and I'll, I'll throw this one more thing in there, is that because we didn't get to meet as many people, what was traditionally not by me felt to be as important, the personal statement actually rose in its value from the standpoint of giving me some insight into what an individual had interests in because we couldn't have those conversations. We couldn't actually have those that, that meaningful dialogue when you're sitting waiting for a case and you wanna chat with the student. So the personal statement that wasn't just, hey, you know, I wanted to become a doctor to help somebody, which that actually got into maybe a little family life, maybe a little work experience, maybe just a little philosophical stuff that took you down a different road, really kind of cued in a little bit more insight into the individual. So I'm sorry that was long-winded, but those were some of the things that I learned over the course of the last couple of years. And those are those are really beautiful. I think it's really well stated, and clearly there's been a lot because a lot has changed in just the last couple of years. A lot is changing um, in front of our eyes, if you will. Uh, you know, I want to now move forward into looking ahead into you know what Dr. Guthrie had talked about at the outset, which is the signaling piece um, and some very key questions that I think that kind of are aligned with this. And I'll I'll kick this first question to Dr. Schroeder. Um, you know, what is, what's the, in your mind, right, you know, as sort of, hey, like a pro, program, associate program director kind of looking at this, what's the value of the signaling system? And will this alter how you advise students at UCSF to apply? Or as I've heard from some folks, oh, no, you know, you apply the same. Um, you know, what kinds of differences might you envision if there are any as a result? Well, I think uh, for me, signaling on like the reverse side, when I'm looking at applications, it's just another point in the system of, of looking at it, right? We got rid of like step one scores. We've gotten rid of AOA at half the programs. We've gotten rid of clinical scores, right? Um, and so I do think it's another point in, are you interested in my program? Is this something that you're looking at? So it's another kind of metric that you could add to the algorithm, whatever, whatever algorithm people have. Some programs use additional statements. Some people have additional questionnaires that you have to fill out. Some people have like specific letters of recommendation. Um, so I think that's all kind of from that standpoint. From how I advise my students, it won't really change. My, my goal is to get my students to apply to the programs that they need to apply to to get them to match. You know, I don't want people applying to 144 programs. I don't want them to apply to 87. I show them the data that shows you know, typically how many programs you need to apply to to match. Um, and so I think it's just another kind of metric that they can use to show interest in programs, but it really overall probably won't affect the way that I'm advising my own students. Those are those are some great points. I'm going to swing the sort of next kind of follow question to Dr. Barlow. You know, if you've got multiple students, like we've got seven this year, and obviously multiple places have way more than that. How do you manage the signaling amongst in the same way, you know, uh, as, as before was described about, hey, we've got, you know, students who are applying to a ways in different spots to minimize the overlap. How do you maximize the spread of signaling amongst the students uh, to really, especially if you've got more than, you know, more, more than a few? It's a, it's a great question. So I think to Dr. Guthrie's point, I think we do have to do some weighting of the signals. I would also like to introduce a concept that I've been thinking about with these signals because I really like the number 30. And I think about, I think we're going to need to think about this like a signaling pyramid. So you have the applications that you sent out, which is many people send an application to every spot, which we're not advocating for. We're advocating thoughtful applications. Then you're going to have 30 signals. Um, which I think is a really nice number. Above that, hopefully, if we have in-person interviews, you're going to have maybe 12 to 15 in-person interviews that you can take. So that's a signal when you take an in-person interview with a location. Then the next step up is your away rotations. And you probably have three, four or five of those. So that's a really smaller signal that you're applying when you go somewhere. Gosh, that's a place that you're really interested in going you're gonna have your best chance at that. And then your top signal is your advocacy or your number one card at the end where you say, hey, Dr. Levine, you're my advocate. Will you call this program and tell them that's my spot where I wanna go? So you've got all these different signals that you're using. People think about it as a binary or a one-off in one different direction. But I think you kind of can focus this sphere in places that you want to go. 
And um, and that's where a 30 is really helpful. If they gave us five signals and you got five away rotations, it's like you probably should use your five signals at your away rotations. So it's an interesting way of doing that to kind of target it. And I think it's going to really help the mid tiers. I think as an advocate for my med students, it's going to be how many stretch programs do you have? How many realistic programs do you have and how many programs where um, you know, you, these are places where you would be happy to be. And I would say every place where you can become an orthopedic surgeon is a great place. So it's going to change that differential for each of the students. So as a follow-up to that and kind of knowing what's come up in the chat box is like, Hey, what if you don't have, you don't have a home program, you don't have maybe like devoted faculty, you know, sort of everyone sort of trying to fend for themselves. How do you coordinate that? You know, how do you coordinate that for the many programs where, you know, there are multiple students applying, they don't really, you know, they're sort of just trying to figure out themselves. How do you sort of try to, because you're obviously in the position where you're advising, but how might they consider it if they don't have that, you know, faculty infrastructure? I think that's hard. I mean, I think you're, you're going to have to try and build a network of people and then trust the people that you ask questions of. And I think there's such a strong sense in all of us of being Rudy and, and getting into the place that we really want, you know, by blood, sweat and tears. And I think you have to use, you know, use the ortho mentor uh, platform, use the websites that we have, use the interchanges that you can have when you do your away rotations, make strong connections with people there those residents where they applied, every spot you're making connections to understand and learn more about yourself and those programs and then figure out where to where to wait it. I don't know that I that I have a specific advice. It's just going to be so much of a one-off, but you're going to have to find some advocate in in that world that will give you some reasonable advice at the best level that they can and then uh, try and use those signals in the best possible way. But your best signal remains your away rotations at programs that you go to, that's going to be where you can show who you are in the way that you're going to be. And we continue to match a high rate of our away students, and it's our best chance of learning about people. Hey, John, John, lots of questions since you brought it up and others have as well. How does a student know if the program is a reach program, is a non-reach program? If they're not getting any mentorship or counseling or guidance, uh, how on God's earth are they supposed to know that important question. I, uh, I think the most chat, I think the best way is to talk to residents who've just gone in. So the junior level residents probably have the most insight. Places without a home program, you're going to have to really work to latch onto somebody and then drive some connections with your, with your away rotations, because it is a little bit harder. Um, I, I know for myself, I know a lot about Mayo's orthopedic program and the things we do well, but I also don't know the moving parts of every residency program across the country. The, the people who just last year did took 40 interviews and they're in your program, they're going to have a lot of information about all those programs. They shouldn't have taken that many, but they're going to know a lot about those programs. So I think the junior level residents are probably some of the most helpful to understand competitiveness of different programs because they also know each one of them knows their fellow med students from their med school classes where they got interviews and things like that. You know, I, I would just jump in and add sort of what all the signal, while signaling is this formalized term, it basically speaks to this notion of networking, right? Which is something that we've had to sort of very quickly learn um, how to do, how to engage in a virtual format and, and in a way that we've never had to do before. And, and so those talking to folks like you see here, um, folks at your school, even if they're not orthopedic surgeons, it's the advising and so on, can at least be beneficial to try to get some semblance of insight. But as I put in the chat box earlier, um, you know, I talk, every student that reaches out to me, I talk to, um, or at least make myself available to talk to them with the goal of trying to give them some insight about the strengths of their application, uh, maybe what programs might be a reach if they're considering a ways. Um, but again, it's, it is a little bit of a nuance and the longer a period of time you can start, you know, if you start in your first year, you have a much better odds of connecting with people, establishing relationships versus if you're just trying to figure it out in your third year. So just food for thought as you're moving forward. You know, I'll ask this to everybody. If a student doesn't, it's only 30. So if a student doesn't signal a program, will they get an interview at your respective institutions? Dr. Kogan, I'll go.
So, I mean, this is the first year with this. And so I think we're probably going to um, review our applications in a similar manner as we always did. Um, I think the signals will definitely play a role in it. But if the application isn't on par with what we normally take, then we're not going to take a signal student that isn't the same caliber of students that we normally take. And then that signal will go away and then we'll go, you know, to down, down the list. Um, so I think we're probably going to approach it from from that regard that um, but we're going to take all we're going to go through applications in a similar manner as we always did see how the signals go this year and then kind of move forward from that. Well, I was saying, you know, I, I agree with what Monica was saying. I think that, you know, when it comes down to reviewing, you know, 700 applications and you bring the ones up to the top that look like they're going to be the best applicants, and then you get down to, you know, we interview 60 people, um, and then you're going to have still hundreds of applications that are outstanding. And then you're going to be looking at the ones that signaled you versus the ones that didn't signal you. And I think that's probably where we'll, we'll use it more often is when you have two equivalent students and one signaled you and one didn't. And so I, you know, and then there's still going to be people that signal you that it's like too far of a reach for them for their program. They, you know, they don't, maybe they don't have great scores or they don't have great letters or they don't have this or that. And so even though they signal you doesn't mean that you're going to give them an app, an interview. Um, and I'm going to sort of skip ahead just a little bit to kind of bring in some other important things. We could probably spend hours, like I'm sure Dr. Guthrie has, uh, thinking about signaling as a whole. But I know some other really important things as we're kind of wrapping up here, heading towards the end, um, is you know step one versus step two. And even though I had Dr. Kogan tag for this, I'm going to actually think Dr. Harvey. How will step one be? You know, student comes in, pass fail. Another student has a score, you know, how, and they've got everything else that's similar. Who, you know, how, what are you going to use to sort of decide whether you take one or the other, knowing that you've got one that's a pass and one's a, and step two isn't available yet uh, for either student. So that's sort of the scenario. What do you think? So are we assuming that we're interv interviewing them already or to select them for an interview? To select them for an interview. Yeah. You're going through the, the thousand plus applications I've come to you. I had a much better answer for the other way, but this one is going to be a challenge because I, I, I don't really know. I, I mean, at this point, I should probably have a better and more strategic answer, but the truth of the matter is, is that while cognitively um, it, it should be, we should be trying to level the playing field, which is the whole purpose of eliminating the scores. The reality is, is that if somebody floats at 265 by me, it's going to be hard to turn that down over the field of pass fail. And, and that's just being honest, you know, I mean, and, and vice versa. I mean, if, if it's, if, if everything else is equal and somebody's trying to slip in at 224, then that may have to factor in as well. And so um, I, I know those are a little more extreme, you know, you put somebody right in the middle there in the 240, 250 range and, and where a lot of people lie. And uh, I, I don't know that we have an answer for that. I think that um, going back to one of the questions you asked me before, it does, um, it, it does, it will matter more to look at the letters and things like that, but to get the numbers down from whatever thousand plus applications, um, there's gonna need to be some level of metrics. I think we'll probably to play it fair rely a little more heavily on the step two score to make it more even and level um, rather than a step one. But I think if it comes down to it, um, things like these nuances, signaling, having an, an, you know, an identifiable and a fairly um, a polarizing score may actually be an advantage for an individual. So uh, those are some great points and great points from everyone all around. I'll throw this sort of follow-up question to uh, uh, on this same uh, note to uh, Dr. Barlow. So if now, sh you know, so now I've had this, the question come up a bunch of times. I did great on step one. Should I take step two late, right later? Or should I take it right away? That's been the proverbial question the last few years. Now we've got the scenario that we, that I posed to Dr. McGarvey 
Some have step, some folks will have pass fail step one, so we'll have a scored step one. Should students be taking step two earlier because programs may be varied in terms of their emphasis on step two? Is that something that you're advising your students? Is it something students ought to be considering um, just as the tides are? My opinion, a couple of points. Number one, step two seems to historically have correlated better with residency performance than step one scores in general. So there's some data that says step two actually correlates with residency performance a little bit better. So it's maybe a little better test. Number two, I am not going to punish. Uh, we are not going to punish people if their school did not allow them to take step one in time. Some schools are regulating it. That said, so there we will have access to the step one data. I strongly suspect that we're going to heavily use the step two CK scores. I think everyone should take that test. This is my opinion. I think people should take that test and I think people will look at it um and they will use it as an assessment of their ability to take standardized tests which is not the driving factor of our lives but they do have to take a standardized test when they become orthopedic surgeons to be board certified after so it is not totally irrelevant to us but i think they do have to take step two i would advocate everybody does and i think we'll probably request that everybody has a step two when they apply for our program that's my sense i don't know what the rest of the panel thinks Dr. Kogan, I'll direct that question to you as well. And you're talking about uh, whether we need to take step two or not with a good step one? Whoops. Should students be taking it earlier, even if they, you know, crush step, step one, just knowing that programs may be looking at that a little bit more focally, given the sort of diversity of, you know, some will have pass fail, some will have um, a scored step one. Yeah, so um, I'm not a huge fan of step one, but I am, a, you know, I do understand that it does limit and does allow for us to approach the applications a little bit more holistically because it can cut down a substantial amount of applications. Um, step two, however, even though it is associated with better performance or correlated with performance in residency, better than step one for a lot of schools and a lot of students, they are not gonna have taken a lot of their core clerkship before taking step two. So there's some people, if they wanna take it earlier, may not have had medicine, may not have had OB, and they are having to take the test or the school isn't offering it. So then, then is that really fair at that point? So, um, I mean, I don't, you know, I think that if someone has a good step one and they haven't taken all the courses for step two, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I really, I think it's up to them, but, um, and, and how they are as a test taker and if they think that they'll be able to do well on it. Amazing points. And I think there will be, I'm sure, a spattering of opinions from the student side, you know, med school side and everything. And I want to uh, not take up too much more time as we wrap up here. Um, you know, one thing that has come up that a lot of people are asking about is a way rotation, it's not that they're back. Um, you know, and just I'll throw this to Dr. Schroeder, um, you know, should students be coordinating amongst themselves? And you kind of met, alluded to that earlier. Um, and then also, how late is it to do in a way? Um, yes, students should coordinate, right? I think it's always good to do that, um, like we talked about before. Um, in terms of how late it is to do in a way, um, I've been doing this for, you know, 10 years now, organizing our sub -eyes. Um, and we've always had a semi season that begins in May and runs through October, November, but you have maybe like one or two in October, one in November. I've never seen this many applicants coming through in September, October, and even November this year. So I think um, my, my guess is that's pretty universal uh, with everyone is that, you know, people's electives have been pushed back. A lot of people, um, a lot of school programs are doing that. So we definitely have people coming in November and we have like a full roster in October, which we've never had before. Um, and so, and, and, you know, we used to interview in November or sorry, in December, so that November was like very late. Um, I think it's late. It's certainly on the late side because your applications are due in October, um, but it's not terrible, if, especially if it's a program that you're interested in and you're there and you do awesome, right? And that is a rotation that you have to crush because that's the only way that you're going to get an interview is when you are awesome and everyone thinks that. So, the only the, yeah. Nikki, the only terrible thing is if you're at a place in November and that they distribute the interview invitations while you're there and you don't get one. Right. And, and I actually had a student that that happened to that I was mentoring. So 
just be careful about those November interviews or November uh, rotations. Yeah. And we tell people um, we don't guarantee an interview in November, you know, so that they, they should keep that in mind, but that, you know, that we, we are still, we give you an equal chance. The all, all wonderful thoughts. I will ask sort of the, the group, how many, how many way rotations is two, like what's the max number you would tell any one student to do? Is it three, is it four, is it five? Someone just asked that in the chat box. What's the maximum number of rotations you would advise us to, uh, way rotations, not including the. Dr. I mean, McGarvey, I, go first. Oh yeah, oh. go. <laughs> no, oh, no, Dr. Go, Shurt, go for it. Go. I just was saying that, you know, I usually tell people to do two aways and one home. Um, a lot of people are doing three aways this year. And I always tell my personal story that, you know, by the time I did my like second away, I was like so tired. I mean, just so tired. So if you're going to do three aways, make sure you take a break in between because remember, that's a month long interview, you know? So three is a lot. Bill McGarvey? Um, yeah, I don't know if I have a number. I think it's, uh, I think to Nikki's point, there's uh, uh, probably a, an important point is just how much energy do you have, you know, and, and the school will oftentimes limit it. Um, I will limit you to three sub eyes in the same specialty. And so I don't have to really advise them. We just leave it at that. But it, there are oftentimes students who want to take vacation time and go spend a week or two weeks at a at another place on their own time. Um, I think that's reasonable, but it it has to be you, you have to be on during that time. If you go there, you're tired, you don't present your best self, then you've wasted that time and you've wasted that opportunity. All right, fi final questions as we sort of go around just one per each person, just a quick fire, Dr. Barlow. Um, what is the, uh, do you think it's going to be virtual or in-person interviews? I pray for in-person interviews. I think it's good for okay. the applicants. The applicants want it. Perfect. Dr. Kogan, how's the, what's the best way to stay connected with folks you, you know, you met on your away rotation um, or even mentors you sort of, or re mentoring relationships you developed along the way? What would you suggest to kind of just maintain those relationships after you leave a given facility? I would say just uh, be in touch either through email, you can set up a Zoom interview, I mean, a Zoom meeting, um, you know, after rota after an away another away rotation, after, you know, rotations that you've been on and just kind of talk through things and just stay connected. And Dr. Sh Dr. Schroeder, second, second to last question, what are sort of three top, three top pieces of advice to succeed on an away rotation? Um, work hard. Don't miss the same question twice, <laughs> you know, um, and ask for feedback at the end of your rotation, because especially if you're doing three aways and you do the same thing that bothers somebody on rotation one and you do it on rotation and two and rotation three, you know, you're never going to learn. And our goal, your goal is to learn about our program, to learn about orthopedics. Our goal is to teach you something right? When you come out here, I want you to learn ortho from us and learn about, you know, how to manage fractures, how to take care of things, but ask for feedback, both from the residents and the faculty, because it can be really helpful and transformative. If you did something that really bothered somebody and they tell you that, then you won't do it on your next rotation. So really ask for feedback. And final question to both Dr. McGarvey and Dr. Levine. What is the most important attribute, non-academic, attribute that you feel is representative of an applicant who succeeds through the match and in residency? Dr. McGarvey. For Thanks for leaving me with the easy ones. Um, I would say the, the probably you got to show that you, that you care. I mean, it, it, it seems so simple, but you know, I mean, everything matters and you have to demonstrate that you know there's no there's nothing that no no stone gets unturned you know helping at the the most trivial or what you assume is the most trivial level you know you're there 
to demonstrate your best self. And so the attribute is, is just demonstrating that you care enough to put your whole self into that rotation. If you have to mop floors, if you have to, you know, pick up dirty laundry, whatever you may have to do to get it done, you're willing to do. Very well said. So I, I would say um, integrity is the most important attribute that is going to predict success for all of us. We're in the surgical education business. That relationship relies on trust. And my giving the sharp, dangerous object to you as a student or a resident or as a fellow relies on me being able to trust that you've done your part to earn that. And when you see a patient in the ER on my behalf and you don't recognize that there is a anterior glenoid fracture on a shoulder dislocation that you reduced and now it dislocated again, then there's, and you say you looked at it and you didn't see it, you gotta be honest. You have to own it and say, yeah, you know what? I, I missed that. And that's cool, but you can't, you can't BS. And so it's all about integrity. Final note that I'll say tonight, um, I know that we're past already. First of all, thanks to everybody. Uh, we could go another three hours. Obviously there's so many questions. Thanks to everybody. We put our emails in the chat box for people who wanna reach out. So don't hesitate. Uh, I will say this to the students. If you look at last year, the two variables that hopefully will not be repeated was number one, virtual interviews. And I know there's a cost burden or debt burden involved, but at the end of the day, you're looking for the career job and doing that from a Zoom box as efficient as it is, is not as good as in person. I think a lot of people would agree. It's not universal, I get that. And number two, only one away rotation. Definitely hurt some really outstanding students last year. So if you're at a school, we've had some questions in the chat box that's only allowing you to do one away rotation. I would get your student leadership together, talk to your school, uh, which they did at Columbia because initially they said they could only do two aways. Uh, we petitioned and we're gonna do th let our students do three aways because even though I'm with Nikki, I don't think we should be doing three. That's the competitive playing field right now. And I don't want our students to be at a competitive disadvantage. Um, Tabs, you get the final word. Thanks very much, everybody, for being here. And thanks to the faculty for spending your uh, Tuesday night with us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah Dr. Guthrie, Dr. Schroeder, Dr. Kogan, um, Dr. McGarvey, um, and uh, Dr. Levine, of course. Uh, you know, thank you all for being here. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to connect. It's wonderful to share information. Be careful about what you hear and read and see that's out there, okay? Make sure you're listening to the people, as been mentioned, to your faculty advisors. Residents are a great source of information, but things are changing from when they even went through the process. Things are changing from when we went through the process. So this is a, as it evolves, um, whether for better or for worse, as you, however you look at it, you have to be able to stay kind of up, stay up with it. So use us as resources to at least give you some perspective, some insight. Don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you all so much once again. Uh, have a great night and thank you to the faculty as well. And thanks to Don Vega and Jonathan Brown from Columbia for staying on and, and managing all 690 of you who were on and the 1100 that uh, registered. Have a good night, everybody.